questions in the chat box may get lost, so please just make sure, and I do this all the time, that your Q&A goes in the Q&A and your chat goes in the chat. Um, so if you called in, you are not going to necessarily see all these features, and um, if you're having any kind of technical difficulties, feel free to use the chat and we will help you um, as best we can. In a follow-up email, you're going to receive a link to the webinar recording, a copy of the slides, and continuing education unit information and forms. And uh, so for my solid waste and recycling colleagues, just yesterday we learned that National SWANA is gonna give one continuing education credit for this. And that's even if you watch the recording. So if you have colleagues that need continuing ed units and were not able to join today, they can watch um, and, and get credits. So with that, I think we'll officially start. And as I mentioned, we'll be recording this. So if you are a Twitter, Twitter person, the hashtags for today's event are story of plastic and break free from plastic. So we would love it if you guys were to, to tweet. Our agenda for the next hour is going to include a quick overview by each speaker, questions for the panel that were submitted in advance, and some live questions, and then a short wrap up. All right, so next slide. My name is Kelly and my pronouns are she and her. I'm a campaigner with the Center for Biological Diversity, working to address the connection between human population growth and consumption and their threat to endangered species and wild places. I actually started my environmental career working in the recycling industry and I did that for 15 years. I was a local recycling coordinator before moving to the state of North Carolina and my work included operations, environmental education, and a policy component. I then moved to DC and worked at the issue at the national level. And I started with the center just last year and my work focuses on decreasing production and consumption of stuff. So really kind of focused on the, the other R's besides recycling. I'm excited to be hosting this webinar with Sarah from the New Mexico Recycling Coalition about the story of plastics documentary and the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. And if you didn't get a chance to watch the movie, your uh, viewing link will be good until the end of the day. So feel free to jump in, or if you only got through half of it, the viewing link should still work. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah to introduce our speakers and moderate our panel. Thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, as Kelly mentioned, I am Sarah Pierpont. I am the executive director of the New Mexico Recycling Coalition. We are a statewide nonprofit with the mission to inspire New Mexicans to reduce, reuse, and recycle. Our nonprofit is very proud of New Mexico Senator Tom Udall and his efforts to um, end plastic pollution. If you're like me, when you watch the story of plastic documentary, you may have felt helpless or frustrated or maybe even overwhelmed and angry, yet wanting to do something. I think you'll find that the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act is a first step that does something to significantly mitigate the plastic waste crisis. When I learned about this landmark piece of legislation, it helped me shift from feeling helpless and overwhelmed to really hopeful. All of our panelists are innovators and they contributed to these efforts to change our current broken system and begin real efforts to break free from plastic pollution. So first we have Jonathan Black. He is a senior policy advisor on energy and environment issues for Senator Tom Udall's office. He has nearly 20 years experience in the Senate covering a variety of high profile issues such as plastic pollution reduction, climate change and renewable energy. Welcome Jonathan. Sydney Harris works at the Product Stewardship Institute as a senior associate for policy and programs and leads packaging extended producer responsibility efforts at the Institute. Her background in marine science and conservation ultimately led all the way upstream to producer responsibility. Welcome, Sydney. And Julie Teal Simons is a senior attorney at the Center for Biological Diversity and works in the Center's Oceans Program to help protect, to help protect marine biodiversity and ecosystems. A big warm welcome to all of our panelists, Sydney, um, Julie, and Jonathan. We are going to um, kick it off with Jonathan giving us a presentation 
um, and then we'll follow up with Sydney and Julie, then we'll go to questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan and we'll start with his slides, please. Great, thanks for the intro, Sarah. Everyone can hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, thanks also Kelly, Center for Biological Diversity, Sydney, everybody. Uh, and Sarah were so instrumental in putting this bill together. And I'm really uh, pleased to, to address everyone. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I work with Senator Tom Udall. Uh, I've been with him for about seven years, uh, working on a lot of high profile environmental issues, uh, which is his credo there. Um, as we started thinking about big issues to, to contemplate, uh, you know, plastic pollution was one where the federal conversation was really, uh, stalling behind what was happening at state and local levels and internationally too. So that's why we spent so much time uh, putting this bill together. And if you advance to the next slide, I'm not gonna talk about all the different uh, policy proposals in the bill. Um, this is for your, you to have uh, when you take home your stuff. Uh, but the thing that I loved about the story of plastic was, you know, I watch a lot of these documentaries uh, on plastic pollution. And they really, a lot of them fall short when they talk about the solutions. They kind of end with, a, well, here's what you can do personally to address and reduce your own personal consumption. Uh, the thing I loved about the story of plastic, and I've seen it several times, is it goes through all of these different policies. And it really talks about what is needed to get a grasp. And it's not just individuals taking action, but it's really uh, showing responsibility for those that are making the products to begin with and how they're made. And so I'll go through a couple highlights if you advance to the next slide of what is in the bill. Um, it starts really with this sort of trifecta of simple plastic laws that you've seen around the country, around the, the, the world um, to reduce the amount of products that we're seeing show up as pollution. This is a, a slide from uh, Ocean Conservancy. They really do uh, tremendous work on cleanups, ocean cleanups, and they track what products they find. And, and for many years now, they've found that the top 10 items are all plastic items. And so a lot of these items uh, are highly polluting. Uh, if you try to recycle them or sort them for recycling, they do damage to recycling uh, machinery, as you can see in the, the bottom right. And uh, there's no markets for these items if you do turn them into recycling. And so those big three things here are a ban on plastic carryout bags. Uh, we found that that ban is also best when it's coupled with a fee on alternative uh, bags like uh, paper bags to help remind people to bring items to the store. A ban on foam food and drinkware. Uh, everyone knows it as styrofoam or expanded polystyrene. Um, and straws and utensils available upon request. And, you know, uh, I, I love drinking without a straw. I don't need to, every time I go out to get a straw with my item, if I need it or if somebody is in need of a straw, uh, to ask for it instead of ending up with uh, unnecessary, I have a, a, a drawer full of plastic utensils that I didn't ask for when, you know, I get some kind of takeout. If you advance to the next slide. Um, so, those items, that's a very simple thing that we can do. We're seeing it happening across the country. Uh, the bulk of this bill, though, is really talking about um, how we handle uh, plastic pollution and uh, require producers to take responsibility. Uh, it's called extended producer responsibility. And if you look at this slide, you'll see this is what we're doing with our 35 million tons of plastic waste right now. We're sorting it, about 8.4% of it gets sorted for recycling. That doesn't mean it gets recycled. It goes overseas to the poor countries. It goes into incineration. It goes into landfills. And we're paying millions of dollars. If you advance to the next slide, that is a waste and it's totally inefficient. This bill uh, really wants the producers to start taking into account what happens after the consumer uses it. So a person sells it, you take it home, then instead of the municipalities and taxpayers paying for the collection and the materials to be sorted and everything, the producers really need to take that into account. And when they do that, instead of just putting marketing and this is what's gonna sell us the most, they're gonna start thinking about what's most sustainable. This is called extended producer responsibility and it's a major feature of the bill. If you advance to the next slide. We only have five minutes, so I'm trying to go very quickly. Uh, another portion of this bill, we put 10 cents on 
our beverage containers. If you look at this guy here um, in Tennessee, I mean, there is no value to these items, and so they get lost to the environment. States, there are about 10 states that have um, uh, retain, um, container deposit funds on their, um, on their beverage containers and they get returned. Michigan, Oregon, they're the states with the highest amounts. They get these things returned in high amounts. Uh, I know I'm coming up on five minutes, but go for forward. We got a few more slides. I'll be very quick. Um, once we get those things back, we want to turn them into uh, other items. And so we have these, you know, plastic beverage bottles. We want 25% of that bottle to be made from recycled content by 2025 and going forward. Uh, I don't want to pick on Coca-Cola here, of course, but you know, there's many companies, they, a lot of them have pledged to these types of goals, as you can see uh, on the right-hand side, Coca-Cola's aims. Uh, they've been doing this since 2007 and earlier, you know, and the fact is that it costs money to do this. Virgin plastic is cheap and they're not going to incorporate recycled content unless there are requirements. So that's why that's a part of this bill. Uh, one more slide here, two more or a few. Um, we've been sending our waste overseas. You can see this fellow in Indonesia holding up our Kirkland and Trader Joe's garbage. Uh, our bill uh, prohibits the ban, uh, prohibits the export of plastic waste to these countries. These countries, uh, developing countries, they can't handle this. They were never meant to. And frankly, this is not waste that anybody can handle. The United States is not doing a good job. So we need to keep it here reduce the amount and recycle it and reuse our items and not send it overseas. So we ban the export of plastic waste to developing countries. Another slide. <clears throat> we also uh, try and make a very direct link to climate change. Um, the extraction and production of these, of these of, of plastic is, is a greenhouse gas super emitter. And so um, the industry is trying to build many, many, many plants right now. Uh, our bill puts a pause of three years while we look at you know, the impacts as well as put um, regulations. This bottom left, you can see these holding up. That's not sand, those are called plastic pellets or nurdles. And there is no law right now, no regulation that prohibits the dumping directly of these plastic pellets into our waterways or railways or whatnot. Uh, go ahead forward. Uh, the bill was put together over a whole year. Um, we had a lot of stake uh, stakeholder outreach. We heard from so many different folks. Right now we have about 500 uh, nonprofit groups or environmental groups or, or stakeholders that are endorsing the bill. We want to increase that. I know that we have a lot of uh, municipalities and local governments on the phone today. We'd love to have some coordinated effort to get uh, folks behind there on that front. And we're moving forward on this and, 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 and trying to get this bill uh, into law as soon as possible. My contact information is on the next slide. Uh, I went over a little bit. Sorry, there's a lot to say, but uh, I'm done here. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, I guess I will jump right in. Everyone can hear me? Yes, wonderful. Um, we so hear you. Hello, my name is Sydney Harris. Um, I work for the Product Stewardship Institute, as Sarah mentioned, and I'm actually just gonna jump right in. Um, I'll try to be really quick. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about what the Product Stewardship Institute, or PSI, does. Uh, so we are a U.S. nonprofit, and we work to reduce the health and environmental impacts of consumer products from design and production all the way through end of life. And we take a unique approach to solving environmental problems by facilitating dialogues. So we bring all the key stakeholders together and we try to forge lasting agreements that are rooted in producer responsibility and EPR um, and sustainable materials management. We as an organization represent government members from 47 different US states, that's what you see on the map here, and hundreds of local governments. And then we also have over 120 partners from companies, organizations, universities, uh, and international you know, non-US governments. Um, and over the past 20 years, we and our members and partners have really built capacity for product stewardship in the US. So we've done that by conducting both voluntary and legislative product stewardship initiatives. 
So for today, we're really focusing in on EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility, and that's a legislated type of product stewardship. So if you go to the next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, so PSI has helped to pass over our 20 years, 119 EPR laws in the US. They span 33 states and Washington DC and they cover 14 different products. So there's, you know, there's been a lot of ground plowed on this issue. However, one of the areas where we don't yet have EPR laws anywhere in the country is packaging. You go to the next slide. You all know from watching the story of plastic or, or just living in the world today, um, that we're really facing a flood of packaging in this country, especially plastic packaging, and our systems are not able to keep pace with this. Uh, also, today's packaging is made of really complicated materials and they're only getting more complicated. They're really difficult or sometimes impossible to recycle with our current infrastructure and this complicates their end of life management. Next slide, please. Thank you. So you also know my flowchart is not as pretty as Jonathan's flowchart, but bear with me. Uh, you also know that our recycling system has been broken for a really long time, right? So on the one hand, as consumers, all of us pay producers for products that they put on the market. They often come with packaging we don't want, we didn't ask for, and we don't know how to get rid of. And then on the other hand, as taxpayers in the U.S., we pay our municipalities to deal with our packaging waste, which they didn't have any input in designing. And we heard about that in the film as well. Um, and the costs of keeping up with this system and emerging packaging have really skyrocketed over the past few years and municipalities are struggling with mounting budgets for recycling. Now they frequently have to pay recyclers, as many of you will know, to take materials that they used to be able uh, to sell to, to make a profit. Next slide, please. So EPR uh, for packaging puts producers in charge of the materials that they put onto the market, as Jonathan mentioned already, and it goes all the way through their end of life. Next slide, please. This is my other very advanced flow chart. Um, it really realigns uh, the whole fragmented system that we currently rely on, and it includes a role for every stakeholder in the process. And I'll note here that I say EPR for PPP on top, and PPP is just our abbreviation for packaging and paper products, which usually are grouped together for these kinds of, of laws. Next slide, please. So one of the main features of EPR for PPP is that it can provide incentives for, for producers to use better packaging um, and achieve better environmental outcomes. And then I have one more slide. Thank you. So over the past two years, the U.S. has really seen a groundswell of support for EPR for packaging or PPP. We know at least 10 states that have introduced or are considering uh, EPR bills for packaging. And of course, there's the Federal Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, which you know we've just heard about, um, and that would implement EPR at a national scale for packaging. Um, and I just want to close by saying PSI really strongly supports these efforts. Um, one of the main things that we do as an organization is we work behind the scenes with policymakers to provide model bills, provide framework legislation, and we have um, developed fundamental principles of EPR over the last 20 years across products and for packaging as well um, that, that we see in these emerging bills. Um, so we're really proud to have contributed to the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, as well as most of the state level EPR bills. And we're looking forward to what I think is the not too distant future when I really believe EPR for packaging will be implemented in the U.S. And that was it. That was my very brief <laughs> shell EPR overview. Thank you so much, Sydney. And I'm back. I'm not sure what happened. I got kicked out for a while, but now here I am. Okay. And um, we'd like to next move to Julie from the Center for Biological Diversity. Julie. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Sarah and Kelly, for organizing this. And it's great to see Sydney and Jonathan. Um, like you all already noted, I'm an attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. I'm in the OCEANS program, and we are a nationwide nonprofit with offices scattered across the country and also one in Mexico. Um, we have about 1.7 million members and online supporters. And I'm just really excited to see all these participants on the call. And I wanted to say hi to my local eco, eco cycle in Boulder, Colorado. I noticed that they are on the call and that's where I'm based here in Boulder, Colorado. 
Um, but I grew up in San Diego. I grew up on the coast. I just always loved the ocean and the wildlife um, in the ocean and knew I wanted to do something to protect it. So I actually made my own undergraduate major in marine ecology and pollution and then went on to law school. And I was really excited to see the Ecology Center in Berkeley in the movie Story of Plastic because that's where I went to college at, in Berkeley. And that part of the film was just really captivating. And I would love to be able to talk to all of you and learn more about um, what you do and kind of the economics of recycling, because I think that's a big issue that we're facing. Uh, as you can see from the slide, that's me with my daughter at my hometown beach last summer, but um, our mission is basically to ensure that, that those that come after us still have a wild uh, world to live in. And at the center, especially the Oceans Program, we are increasingly concerned about the impact of plastic pollution on biodiversity and our planetary systems. Um, so you can go on to the next slide. I think some of this you all know, but plastic is literally pervading our bodies and our, our, our water and our air system. So we're seeing a buildup of waste in, in oceans and in landfills. We're seeing the impacts of plastic pollution on marine life through entanglement in fishing gear and other plastic products and through ingestion of plastic. Um, we're also seeing like Jonathan said, the fossil fuel infrastructure and pollution that's required to produce plastic is enormous. And we're now understanding that we are literally breathing and ingesting plastic. There's a great picture of Senator Udall holding up a credit card because they now think that we're all ingesting five grams of plastic per week, which is the, the same amount that's in a, a, your you know basic credit card. Um, another thing that really concerns us that Kelly has a lot of experience with is that it really perpetuates um, our shift into this throwaway culture and single-use culture, and we want to move away from that. So like, like the bill that Jonathan talked about, we know we can't just ban bags and straws, although that's a great first step. And our focus at the center is really on reducing plastic pollution at its source, so trying to scale back the production of plastic. <clears throat> and um, Jonathan, I just wanted to mention, I was laughing when you mentioned your drawer full of utensils because I actually require my husband to check the bag and give them back. <laughs> so that's another thing you can do because that drawer of plastic utensils drives me crazy. Um, so yeah, this slide here has some of the, some pretty astounding statistics on just how much plastic is impacting wildlife. It's a huge underestimate, but we think that at least 8 million tons of plastic uh, enters the oceans every single year, including 15,000 plastic bags per day. And over 90% of plastic found in the ocean is single-use plastic. Um, and this is coming from all sorts of things, the utensils, the straws, but also some less obvious sources like tire dust and lost and discarded fishing gear um, and wastewater discharge and stormwater discharges from municipalities. And then like Jonathan mentioned, another really big concern we have for wildlife and for all of us is that plastic producers are making those plastic nurdles or pellets that we call pre-production plastic that then can be molded into all your plastic products. And they're losing trillions of them every single year. I have my own little collection of them. This is from a Formosa plastics plant in Point Comfort, Texas. And uh, this is just flowing out of that facility, even though they just lost a $50 million, well, they lost the lawsuit and had to pay $50 million in a settlement agreement to help clean up the pollution they caused. And they still can't stop these nurdles from flowing into the, to the ocean. So um, I know we do only have five minutes. So I won't go through all the additional <laughs> alarming statistics, but just one more is that a very um, often cited quote is that if we don't stop by 2050, plastic could outweigh fish um, pound for pound in the oceans. So we really need to get a handle on this pollution problem. Um, so yeah, and that zooplankton, I just wanted to mention, so even it's been found in zooplankton, it's been found you know, at the top of the, in the Pyrenees, in the Arctic, it's everywhere. So, um, and plastic unfortunately adsorbs other chemicals and can be very toxic to wildlife. It's like a little sponge for other chemical contaminants. So next slide, if you would. Another point that Jonathan did make, I just wanna emphasize again, something we're focused on at the center is just how tied in the plastic pollution problem is to the climate crisis. That, that one picture is um, a series of well pads. So plastic comes from natural gas in this country. It's an, almost every single piece of plastic started as a natural gas liquid and was uh, you know, further refined and eventually turns into plastic. And 
just a climate catastrophe. That image is from the Center for International Environmental Law, which I encourage you all to visit, cl.org. They have great uh, publications on just how much pollution is coming from the plastic industry and how much more we can expect moving into the future. Um, yeah, so this boom that we have in this in fracked gas in our country, you hear about fracking, the, the, you can use that gas for energy, but you can also take natural gas liquids and that's what they make plastic out of. So plastic industry is really also driving the fracking boom because of the, econo the economy and how gas prices have dropped. Now they're looking at plastic production as kind of their way out of their economic woes and we absolutely cannot allow that to happen. Um, that last little picture real quick, that's what, a, that's what a cracker looks like, a plastics cracker, a plastics production facility. You can see how just extensive it is. These are just enormous, enormous um, facilities. So next slide. <laughs> I think I'm running out of time too. Kelly's going to jump in and interrupt me if I go too long. Um, so what do we do about it? The center strategy really is to focus on that upstream plastic production, even though the, we're worried about the downstream. So uniting to demand nationwide policy solutions. We've submitted two petitions to the EPA to update their Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act standards for these facilities and to prohibit plastic from discharging from these facilities. There's other statutes that we can use as well. I saw someone commented on TOSCA, which is supposed to regulate toxic substances. We're also looking into those mechanisms. Being a part of the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act was huge. Thank you so much to Jonathan and his colleague Shane in the house, Shane Trimmer, for leading on that. You've got great leaders, but you also need staff that do so much work. So that was a really wonderful experience and such a groundbreaking piece of legislation. Um, so, and we're again in that, in that act, we're working on that production piece of it that Jonathan mentioned. A second bucket, so we've got like three main buckets of activity. The second one is challenging permits issued to new plastics plants that are popping up all over the Gulf and Appalachia. So for example, um, just today, we filed for a preliminary injunction against Formosa Plastics, that same facility that discharged these plastics. That company is trying to build a new giant facility in Cancer Alley in Louisiana. And just this morning, I filed for a preliminary injunction against construction of that facility. And then the final bucket that we're working on is other creative legal tactics to bring people together to stop this problem from, from continuing and getting worse. So for example, we're working in coalition on a 2020 executive plastic action plan. There's a lot that a president can do to stop plastic pollution. And we wanna think about what, that, what, what the president can do to stop plastic production, whether it's <laughs> the one we have or a new one. Um, it's important for the executive to take leadership on this. So hopefully I didn't go too far over. <laughs> I'll stop there. Oh, sorry, one more slide. Okay. I threw this in this morning. This is our local plaintiff in the Formosa case. These are the women of Rye St. James. They live here in St. James Parish in Cancer Alley. They're already breathing terribly dirty air and if Formosa Plastics gets to build, it will literally double the air pollution in their community um, and for other environmental and historic resources issues as well that I don't have time to get into, but I just wanted to honor them today and show you this picture of them. Um, that's out at the site near where they found um, a historic cemetery that is believed by experts to contain the remains of enslaved people that once worked on the sugarcane plantation at this location. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Julie. And to all of our panelists, thank you. Uh, we're going to start with a few questions and to um, the panelists and we'll open it up for questions from our audience. Jonathan, I'd like to address this one to you initially. Um, the producers of the movie make it clear that it's not a matter of properly managing plastic waste, that the types and volumes of material are simply unmanageable. Industry representatives cite bad waste management as the problem and note that the challenge isn't plastics, but what happens after they are used. Can you speak to how this message further contributes to the cause of plastic pollution? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. I mean, yeah, industry folks want to point fingers, and it's been a long-seated effort to say it's 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 the consumer's fault, um, it's litter bugs, and and while certainly you know we need to properly dispose of our 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 trash and our plastic, but I mean, you know, globally we're producing about four hundred million tons of plastic. It's unmanageable. 
and it's it's not something that is meant to be managed i mean how can you everybody extols the virtues of plastic being lightweight 400 million tons can you imagine how much that is i mean it is we are suffocating with this and so that's why the bill really tries to turn it back on the producers and say look you're you're marketing your materials they're flashy containers it's got all these different components you know maybe it's technically recyclable in a lab but you know for the broad community um, you know, we have over 300 participants here on the phone today, and I know over 700, uh, you know, registered. You know, if we all took the effort and really, you know, sorted everything properly and correctly and done everything to the, I mean, it really would not, unfortunately, make a huge dent. And of course, we have to continue. I'm not saying don't do it. But the fact is, we need the producers to start, you know, putting the cost of what they're put you know selling into their items and when they do that you know that adds costs and so they look for ways to make less wasteful more sustainable products more reusable products more truly recyclable products and that's the stuff that we can get our hands around to actually try and manage but without them you know at the table contributing money contributing logistics uh it, it falls to us it falls to our local governments our taxpayers and it's millions of dollars for these municipalities, billions collectively across the country. And it's really uh, inefficient and, and not working, so. Yeah, and it's, Sydney, I see you shaking your head. Did you have anything to quickly add? <laughs> You're still muted, there you go. Yeah, I was still muted. <laughs> yeah, no, I just, I totally agree. I think the, I mean, that's, that's obviously why we need EPR, um, in my opinion. Um, I think I love thinking about EPR as like, remember in like high school when you learned about economics, like 101 or like 01, basically, and it was like, you know, there's externalities and these environmental impacts are pretty much the definition of an economic externality. And what EPR does is it forces companies that are producing these materials to internalize those costs. And that's really the whole, that's pretty much the whole thing. Yeah. And that's, that's really what we need. So it's a very simple concept that is like, you don't need to make it super complicated, you know? Well, that kind of leads me to my next question for you, Sydney. Um, we have a lot of recycling professionals on today's call. And I believe that many of us could, res could um, really relate to the gentleman speaking from the Ecology Center in Berkeley. His point about being pressured into ha um, accepting the low value plastics paying to collect them and process them, and then not having markets or having false markets that depend on exports or on global, global poverty. Um, it, it hits home for a lot of us, for a lot of us recyclers. Um, big industry has touted recycling as the end all goal. And this isn't an option for most plastic waste. As recyclers, we wanna be part of the solution, not a part of the problem. What steps do we need to take to make recycling a viable option and how if at all, does chemical recycling fit into the equation? Good question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, so steps to take, we need EPR. We need EPR for packaging. It's the only model that I've seen, not only working at PSI, but also in my background working on plastics before, um, my background in marine science. Like it's the only thing that I've actually ever seen that really legitimately makes recycling more viable for more materials. And we know that because EPR has been in place for 30 plus years around the rest of the world. So this isn't like a theoretical concept, this is a proven concept. Um, and so yeah, the current system as you laid out, it's completely unfair to recyclers. Most of you on this call probably already are feeling that. Um, and I thought they did a great job portraying that in the film. Um, and <laughs> I love that guy from the Center for Ecology. He's like the Matthew McConaughey of recycling. Totally. His accent is like the same. Yeah. <laughs> but he does a really great job raising all the right points. And I think that's, that's exactly why we need EPR. So for example, let's put some numbers to it, right? Um, the most commonly cited EPR model in the U.S. is the British Columbia model from Canada. Um, there are plenty of others. Um, but what we've seen is dramatic increases when EPR is implemented in the actual recycling rates of materials. So for example, in Italy, rates went from 38% recycling for plastics and packaging before EPR to 67% afterward. 
pretty quickly, like over a few years. That's not 100, but it's a 30% increase just from implementing EPR and forcing producers to invest in recycling the materials. Um, in BC, uh, or I'm sorry, in Belgium, which, you know, is usually cited as like the leader for the EU countries, it's like gets the gold star every time. Um, their recycling rates, not recovery rates, but actual recycling rates are 83% for packaging materials. We are only at 50% for recovery in the US, and most of that doesn't effectively get recycled. So they're, they're legitimately doing a way better job. And one of the key features of that is that they require producers to keep the materials domestic. And I think that addresses, you know, uh, so many things. One of the central, I think, aspects of our global recycling economy is how very unfair it is on so many levels. I think from a social justice perspective, it's completely unacceptable. Um, and one of the ways that we fix that is we break that cycle, right? We stop, stop shipping materials overseas. How do you do that? We pass EPR laws that require producers to keep materials domestic and process them domestically, <clears throat> excuse me, or regionally. And so we see that. So in BC, only 1% of the plastic they collect is shipped overseas and it goes to a hand-selected end market that has been audited by the producers in Canada. So they know exactly what's happening to that plastic and it's being safely and effectively recycled. That's only 1% of what they collect. And I think that's really how we address a lot of the, <clears throat> losing my voice, a lot of the inequities in, in the system. Um, to your question about chemical recycling, it's a tough question. I think first, it requires a standardized definition of chemical recycling, which I haven't come across. I've seen a lot of different definitions. There's different aspects here. There's, right, there's people talk about waste to energy, burning plastics to get, you know, extract fuel products from them. And then there's various things that we call chemical recycling that are like pyrolysis and gasification. And they also involve heating the plastic, but then sometimes maybe that's turned into feedstock maybe it's turned into fuel. I think it really depends on what we're talking about. Um, I can tell you that many producers would, would tell you there's a reason that we need chemical recycling right now to increase the amount of feedstock, recycled content feedstock that we can produce because we're not getting there with mechanical recycling, traditional recycling. Um, and I can see an argument for that, but I think the devil's in the details and it really depends on what actual process you're using, what are the impacts and emissions of that process, uh, whether it's chemical or mechanical, because we know those plants take electricity and power and fuel to run also. And then what are you actually doing with what you get out of that process? Because if you're turning it into fuel, that's maybe not a circular economy, right? But if you're turning it back into packaging, maybe there's a place for that. So it, re I, it just really depends. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's a lot to be said about both of those <laughs> questions. I want to um, shift a little bit over to Julie. Um, Julie, when recyclers think of upstream, we think of reduction and reuse, but after watching the movie, um, it's pretty clear that there are a lot of different upstreams that we can take into um, account, including plastic manufacturing, like fossil fuel extraction, transportation, ethane cracker pla cracking plants, the industry has um, significant plans to build more plastic manufacturing facilities out of virgin material. How well do you think people understand that plastic comes from oil and natural gas? And how serious of a problem is the creation of new plastic from virgin petrochemicals for human and global health? Good questions. <laughs> Actually, one of those questions goes to, to what Sydney was just saying. I think we've all read in the news lately that virgin plastic is just so cheap right now, so it's really hard to compete with that. So do we really wanna be downcycling plastic when producers of, material, of products are just choosing that virgin plastic, which has so many other life cycle costs for us and for our ecosystems. Um, and I know when I started working on plastic, I did not, I had not put it together. I'm sure I have something plastic on my desk, but I did never held up my plastic pen and thought this once was fossil fuels that came from you know, eons ago that we're now releasing into the environment in all these new and horrible ways. Um, so yeah, I don't know that, I think recycling industry folks are educated and are very educated. And I know EcoCycle, my local group, sends newsletters out uh, advising us of things like when China stopped importing waste, 
um, or other, they're very good at putting out articles that really tie in these other bigger picture issues. So I really appreciate that about my local recycling facility. Um, but that CL slide that was in my presentation had the smokestacks and the plastic bottles. And what that was um, basically illustrating is that um, right now the life cycle production of plastic is the equivalent of 189 500 megawatt coal-fired power plants operating at full capacity. And that is expected to triple in the, by um, 2050. So that's the trajectory the plastic industry is on. And they're really trying to make the most of this fracked gas boom. And they want to lock us in so that, you know, the Chevrons, ExxonMobil, Shell, all companies in the U.S. that are building these mega facilities, they're, they're going to lock us into this production. These are huge facilities that take, you know, 10 years to build. And if they are allowed to go forward, we're locked into a very polluting um, system and we're going to have a lot of, I think, cheap virgin plastic that I just, I think is going to be disruptive to the recycling, any of those other recycling solutions that you might want to explore. So yeah, it's going to increase about 40% over the next 10 years is the estimate. Um, and another point that I think Sydney made about social justice is that most of these facilities are going in in communities of color and low income communities that already bear the disproportionate burdens of industrial pollution because they're co-locating with refineries and other infrastructure. So it really is, you know, it really is a climate problem and a, an oil and gas industry driven problem. Well, Julie, I, I know you work <laughs> with the center's ocean program to protect marine biodiversity and ecosystems. Near the end of the movie, they talk about bio-based and biodegradable plastics as possible alternatives. These can be an issue for recycling and composting facilities, but um, in terms of a, an environmental impact, how does bio-based or biodegradable plastic affect wildlife and our oceans? Yeah, you know, we don't, and we don't focus a ton on the, like the technical solutions, but we're, I love learning more about them. And I would say that overall, we, what we've learned from these bioplastics is that they really aren't a whole lot better, unfortunately, than plastics for wildlife. They're made like almost too well. They don't actually really, they're, they're pretty durable and they start to fragment and break down into microplastics, much like plastic does. Um, the other problem is a lot of times they're made from not sustainable materials, so like genetically modified corn that can be quite intensive when it comes to like inputs, you know, fertilizers and pesticides and that kind of thing. And I think they do, they, I think was mentioned earlier, they do muck up recycling systems. People throw them in the recycling. They're not labeled properly. And then they also require like industrial composters to break down. So I think a lot of even composting facilities don't really want them right now. Um, I think it's different if you're talking about like a plate that's obviously made from kind of a paper product that will probably break down a lot quicker and is more obviously plant-based than like one of those plastic cups that just looks like it's, you know, regular fossil fuel plastic. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, for wildlife, I don't think bioplastics at all are a solution, at least not yet. Um, I, I know I've heard of other technologies like hemp plastic that might be promising, but I just don't know if it's far enough along yet. And the problem is the ad addition also of things like plasticizers to affect the consistency of the material and a lot of times those are not clean and healthy additives. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, switching back over to you for a second, um, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act includes a national container deposit law. Oftentimes, municipal recycling colleagues do not support deposit programs because they worry that their programs will lose revenue as it takes the high value items, such as aluminum, out of their streams for the deposit program. How does your bill work to address this? Or can you speak to this, please? Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, let me, let me speak to this because I have heard this directly from some folks. Uh, and I'm usually more diplomatic <laughs> when, when I have these conversations with folks, but I'm gonna be very frank here today because we're speaking to sort of an internet of 300 plus folks. I mean, the view uh, that the aluminum cans and recycling the scrap is uh, valuable and is offsetting all the other costs, I think is extremely short-sighted and misinformed view. Um, imagine you are the owner of a blockbuster video right now. <laughs> And you are making a little bit of money selling some of those big box candy. People love that stuff. But you're clinging to your business model just to sell that candy. I mean, it doesn't make sense. And you're not accounting for the full 
cost accounting that needs to be done. So municipalities need to use a full cost accounting approach to understand you know, how deposit programs save money for municipalities. So it's true that you know, aluminum cans are worth some money, but using just that one figure is cherry picking and it doesn't reflect the full economic budgetary situation. You have to think, you know, you have three different beverage container types, you know, aluminum, plastic, glass. There is a cost value for collecting and recycling and a revenue number for the sale of that scrap material. And in order to understand the full cost of recycling these three things, you need all six numbers. So in addition to that, all three of these material types are in the disposal stream, which means there are three more cost items. Curbside programs you know, rarely capture more than 50% of these materials and the rest are disposed of littered. So you have that last cost factor, which is the cost of cleaning up the beverage containers that are littered. And once you consider all of these costs and all of these revenues, the scrap material revenue only covers about one fourth of your total costs. And the other three quarters are costs that are paid by the municipalities and by the taxpayers. So, you know, it's the blockbuster video, again, you know, people love their, their, their big box candy things that are like the movie theaters, but they are hemorrhaging money and that's why they went out of business. And, you know, so our view is you put a value to the containers, you give an incentive for people to return them in a clean and more direct manner that doesn't end up in litter, that creates material streams that are clean to be sold directly for recycling. It's working in the states that have them. There are some problems in some states and whatnot. Our bill is modeled off of the very popular and very effective Oregon model, where the producers are the ones that run the program. They set up depot stations. They make sure there's access to everybody, you know, from rural to urban to everywhere. Um, and they uh, end up keeping the revenue of stuff that is not refunded, but required to recycle, to turn that into recycling, to build out the infrastructure. And so I think, you know, again, the reason we see so much litter and plastic pollution showing up on our roads, on our beaches, it's just valueless. And so if you give people the incentive to return it, to reuse it, to actually recycle it, it won't end up in the environment. So that, that's the approach the bill takes. Thank you, that's, that's, I like that analogy. <laughs> um, I'm gonna switch over, I, we, I, I could talk to you guys all day. And I really appreciate that you'll be answering some of the questions coming in from the audience um, with, with, with afterwards with written responses because we have gotten a lot of questions and we're not gonna get to all of them, but I do wanna touch on at least two that are really um, kind of a theme that I'm seeing in the questions. Um, the movie is a great reminder that there's a lot of R's before we get to recycle. There's reduce, reuse, repair, all the R's we love. Um, with COVID-19, something that none of us could have planned for, um, so many household products are becoming more and more disposable in the name of public health. What are your thoughts on reduce and reuse as a viable, scalable solution in light of these new concerns around the pandemic? And I'm going to open this up to anyone. If you ever wants to go first, raise your hand <laughs> or just unmute yourselves. All right, Sydney, I'm going to call on you. Oh, no, there's Jonathan. Jonathan, go I was trying. I was trying to get to the unmute. I changed my screen size. It's all right. Um, you know, my boss has been really upset with how industry has used the pandemic as a way to advertise for their products, which have not been proven anywhere to be, you know, safe or otherwise. And in fact, they have an environmental cost that we will be reaping. And so, you know, I can tell you personally, I go to the grocery store, I bring my reusable bags, I pack them, I know where my bags have been. I, you know, I, I don't know that some, you know, consumers come through and coughed on the plastic bags or, or whatnot. So, um, you know, I really feel like what we're talking about with the reusable economy is, is not uh, to, to fear, you know, germs or whatnot. Everything that we have, you imagine if you have to throw out your iPhone every time you used it. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And so, um, you know, this bill, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, it really tries to reduce those items that are, you know, there are effective alternatives already for them. Uh, we used to use them all the time, and uh, we need to get back to that. And, and, 
And so that's where I'll leave that. Okay. Any other panelists want to add to that? You know, how, uh, Julie, go ahead, how we can switch during COVID-19 and this pandemic that none of us could have expected. Yeah, I, mean, I just want to say that we're all trying to be a little bit flexible right now. And, you know, it's just a crazy time. But, but I also think the fact, like Jonathan said, of industry really trying to capitalize on this, the plastics plant that we're fighting for most of plastics in Louisiana, I literally saw them change their website to put PP on their product site to explain what they're going to be producing. It used to be plastic bottles and playground equipment and tubes and things. And they literally changed their website to put PPE and people of color wearing PPE on their website. And it was just so opportunistic to me, you know. Um, and I also want to mention that plastic industry publications have noted that the demand for plastic has still been falling because of the economy being so slowed down. So while there might be an, an uptick in the need for PPE or cleaning products and disinfectants and masks, there are other uh, demands for plastic that are not on the not rising right now because people, you know, just of the economy being so altered. And so don't let them use this to say we need more plastic to make PPE and other single use products. That's just not defensible. Sydney, a quick response as well, or do they kind of cover it? Yeah, no, I'll say I completely agree uh, with the sentiment that Julie and Jonathan already expressed, and I'll just try to add on some new glimmers of hope for folks on the call. Um, one is PSI uh, has been tracking local and state level policies on plastics that have um, been changed during the pandemic. And I, I can add a link to our tracker um, in the chat box if that's helpful. But I, the main thing here is that these are temporary policies. I have yet to see any of, you know, local bag bans or things like that um, permanently reversed because of the pandemic. I think the industry will try, but I don't think they will succeed because people are waking up to this. Um, people are paying attention. People know um, that industry is capitalizing on, on our fears. And we're learning a lot more about the virus. And so I'll also say, you know, PSI was doing a project um, with some restaurants in upstate New York, and we were helping them reduce their plastic footprints before the pandemic hit. And obviously that whole project went a bit sideways <laughs> after COVID, but actually I think it came out really well in the end. And one of the things that we found is that we were able to use some of that funding to do more direct research on, you know, the impacts of COVID on like takeout waste and that sort of thing. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot from other organizations looking at this. Um, there's a really great webinar that's been recorded that many of you may have seen already uh, by Upstream Solutions. And they have, you know, examples of companies right now that are out there adapting to this model. And there are zero waste reuse food delivery systems. And actually that has been helping to drive business to restaurants in a really challenging time because customers can trust like a third party sanitization model for reusable things. So I think there is a lot of hope out there and I think we will, we will figure this out. Okay, I'm gonna try and get through two more questions before I have to turn it back to Kelly. So I'm gonna ask for um, quick responses. The, um, during the registration, we had a lot of questions about individual actions one can take around plastics, things like purchasing power, citizen-based consumer initiatives. Um, as we know from the movie, there are larger systema systematic issues at play. Here, so how does an individual support moving away from plastic, not just bringing your own straw, but support it on a larger systematic um, you know, s manner? <laughs> I'm going to open this up to all of you, Jonathan. Go I mean, ahead. It, it's simple. We got to pass the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, so <laughs> we've got to get folks to, you know, urge their members of Congress uh, to, to support that um, at a local level. I mean, this the bill was really a reflection of what's happening at state and local levels and of best practices. So, you know, start at your local level and you know schools even. I mean, it's short businesses. You know, try and get these policies moving forward. Uh, to do that and, and, and advocate for change. It's not only also advocating with the members of Congress, it's with business. And so you have to, we, we have a concerted effort right now to put pressure on corporations and companies to support the bill and to commit to it. So we would love to see um, that, uh, that pressure from, from citizens as well. Thank you. And, and Julie, what can we do as citizens kind of to turn it back to the um, petrochemical build out to help reduce the plastic pollution at the source and prevent um, this pollution from the, from the 
expanding um, cracking. Yeah, I was going to mention um, Break Free from Plastic Pollution. There's a coalition under that name, and they have great ideas and toolkits for local action. But more to your question, um, definitely getting involved in your local fights. If you have if you have facilities being proposed for your community, you can get on the the mailing lists for your local environmental agencies and other permitting agencies if you're into that policy. You know, a lot of times there's a chances to do public comment, either written, we used to have in-person hearings, I don't know <laughs> when that'll resume, but I think getting involved with those decision-making processes is great. Also just remembering to vote. Um, there's also other legislative efforts that are mutually supportive of what's happening at the federal level. Like in Texas right now, they're introducing a bill to prohibit plastic pellets from the facilities there. So that would have taken care of the foremost pollution problem. So there are a lot of local legislative efforts if you're so inclined to get involved in and, and help get better, bigger support for. I think the participants on this call have so much power in their communities to really educate and to be good allies for decision makers that want to do the right thing. So meeting with those legislators and other, you know, city council members, county um, decision makers. I think that's all really powerful if you all can do Julie, to add on to that, I mean, a lot of these facilities are being built with state tax incentives, millions of mm -hmm. dollars, right? I mean, that's another reason for, for people to be outraged at where their money is being spent. Right. Okay, I ha as much as I don't want to, I, don't, I have to turn it back over to Kelly to, um, to do the wrap up. I could just keep talking to you guys all day. I really appreciate you sharing your wealth of knowledge with all of us and to the people on the call. And um, I'm really excited that you were able to share that with our group today. So thank you very much, Jonathan, Sydney, and Julie. And Kelly, I went over a little bit, but back to you. <laughs> thank you all. There were so many questions coming in, everyone. Um, we, we did ask our speakers before the session if they would be willing to answer some of the questions um, in written form as a follow-up and, and they agreed to do some of that. We had so many come in just from the registration process too. So uh, it was wonderful to see so many people from state and local government and universities on today's call and we have three requests of you. So I know how valuable it is to make space to talk to colleagues and it can be really hard now. So Sarah and I talked about extending this webinar by 30 minutes and putting folks in Zoom breakout rooms so you could talk to each other, but, but we decided against it. But if you'd like to continue this dialogue with others, I'm happy to schedule a follow-up event where we could have another discussion and use the breakout rooms and talk about potential collaboration. So if interested, there's a, a brief interest form in the chat, but it'll also be in a follow-up email to you. Um, and then we want you to ask your members of Congress to co-sponsor the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Prevention Act, which you heard all about today. Um, and then finally, if you'd like to work closer to home and you know, not at the federal level, but as Jonathan said, there's work to be done locally, um, we're gonna be sharing with you a toolkit from Greenpeace on how to work on single use product bans that may be of interest to you or coalitions that you're working with now. Um, all right, and I'm in my last minute. This is, whoo, we got through it. So as a reminder, your story of plastic viewing link will be disabled tonight. Make sure to watch the movie before it expires. If you want others to watch the movie, it can be seen on Discovery Go streaming service and Amazon. And we wanna thank those groups that provided continuing education units, the New Mexico Recycling Coalition, North Carolina SWANA and La Bella Solid Waste Operator and Manager Certification, the North Carolina Environmental Educator um, Program, the Virginia Recycling Association, the Southwest Virginia Solid Waste Management Association, National SWANA, which I just mentioned at the top of the hour, and the U.S. Composting Council. So if you need a certificate or form showing that you attended um, for another organization that wasn't one that I listed, feel free to reach out to me. I will have a certificate and I will be able to see who attended. Um, and we have heard from these groups that you can allow other people to watch the recording afterwards and still get credit. You'll just need to work with me on that. So in this follow-up email, you're going to get the recording, the slides, additional details about the bill, your continuing ed credit um, uh, information, and so thank you so much to everyone for attending and a big virtual round of applause for our presenters. 
And a huge amount of gratitude goes to Sarah with the New Mexico Recycling Coalition for partnering with the center on this. And as you leave the webinar, you will be directed to a survey about the story of Plastics Movie. So please take a moment to share your thoughts about the movie. Thank you all. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Kelly. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your week.